Revelation is where we're going to be at today. Go ahead and open it to that. So I actually started writing this sermon after Thanksgiving. I uh, normally have everything done before uh, Thursday, but uh, not, not this time. We, uh, I, I waited until after Thanksgiving, and, and partly because I, I wanted to kind of sit back and, and really observe Thanksgiving this year and, and observe it in our family. All of us, my, my whole family pretty much was together except for one brother who he lives a few thousand miles away in Texas and he couldn't make it. Uh, but we talked to him on the phone and everything else. But all the rest of my family, all my brothers, we were all together for Thanksgiving. And, and I started thinking about, on Thursday, I started thinking to myself about all the things that I'm thankful for. As I sat there and looked around at my, my wife and my kids, I thought, you know, I'm thankful for a family that loves me. Uh, it's just not always an easy thing to do. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful for a family that loves me. I'm thankful for a mom and dad who love me. I'm thankful for my brothers who love me. I'm thankful for the many journeys of life that I've gone through and the people I've met along the way. I'm thankful for that journey and this journey that we call life. But as I sat there and thought about all of that, one thought kept coming into my mind over and over and over again. That I'm thankful for a gracious God who can take a broken individual like me and redeem me. You know, that day of Thanksgiving, I, I, as the Lions were losing, because uh, we, we root for the Lions, uh, well, most of my family members root for the Lions. You all know that I love the Denver Broncos, which right now I'm not excited to admit that, because uh, they stink. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we were watching the, the Lions game, and of course the Lions almost came back and won that game. If you notice, that guy jumped offside, blocked the field goal, and then ran it down for a touchdown. We had a chance to win, but he was offside, clearly. Uh, but as I was sitting there, I began to flip through Facebook, and I began to look at all the different pictures of all the families that were together on Thanksgiving, uh, the fun times that it looked like they were having and everything else. And, and, and it's just, you know, I think to myself, look at all of these things that we have to be thankful for. But here's the problem that I see so much in our lives and so much around us. We gather for the holidays and we're thankful I don't know what your traditions are at your home. Maybe for some of you, uh, you sit around, you get a big table together and you all sit around as a family and maybe you have to go around that big giant table and you have to say something you're thankful for before you can ever eat. Uh, maybe you do that. We don't. Uh, we had a table. It wasn't a giant table because uh, we all know that the guys are going to grab their food, put it on a plate, and we're going to go watch football because we start eating at 11.30. And the ladies and the kids are all going to sit and eat uh, in there. And you might think that that's terrible, but that's what we do. Um, one of the big traditions we have around the holidays, and really the only tradition I can think of, is my mom makes beans and bacon and just drenches it in vinegar. And that's like our favorite thing in all the world to eat. Uh, that's about our only tradition that we have as a family other than watching football together. But I don't know what your traditions are, but I would imagine that for some of you, sitting around and, and, and giving thanks is something that you probably do. All of those things, those are all well and good. But I fear that this is the only time of year that we thank God for anything. That's my fear. Oh, I mean, we go through the year and we thank God for things here and there and all that kind of stuff, but do we really thank God 365 days a year for all that He does for us, for His grace, for His love, for His mercy? And I fear that we don't. So I want to look at this passage today from Proverbs chapter 15. Let's first look at verse 15. It's there and you know it'll be on the screen, at least it should be on the screen. It says, all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. And I love that last phrase. Maybe underline that in your Bibles or your notes or whatever. The cheerful heart 
has a continual feast. People with a cheerful heart, they have Thanksgiving 365 days a year. But have you ever thought about what is their secret? Have you ever thought that way? Because there are days, aren't there, where you're just not thankful for that day. (laughs) Have you ever met people who it just seems that no matter what you throw their way, they just smile right through it? I've met people like that in my lifetime. I've met people and I just sit back sometimes and I look at them and I say, how do you do it? My sister-in-law, Sherry, who who passed away a few years ago, my sister-in-law, Sherry, was that way. No matter what life threw at her, she could just smile her way through it all. She battled cancer. I know that deep down there was feelings of fear and all that kind of stuff that came up in her. But you never heard it from her. You always heard how thankful she was for all that God was doing in her life. How thankful she was that she got to be around to see her daughter graduate. How thankful she was for all of those things. And I thought to myself, what is the secret to this? Because I want to know. Well, in Proverbs chapter 15, verses 16 through 17, Solomon really reveals two qualities that produce the cheerful heart that enjoys a continual feast. And these attitudes of the heart are within the reach of all of us because it doesn't depend on income. It doesn't depend on our position, our reputation. It doesn't depend on our education. It doesn't depend on the size of our bank account or any sort of worldly attainment. You see, folks, the least among us, they can have a continual feast, can't they? And so let's look at these two qualities this morning that Solomon kind of points out for us. Number one in your notes, first of all, fill your heart with faith. Fill your heart with faith. I'll give you a second to write that down. We're going to jump right into verse 16. Fill your heart with with faith. Look at verse 16 with me. It's in your notes. It says, better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Now I want you to look at that first word and maybe underline it, circle it, whatever. Look at that first word, better. Some things are better than others, aren't they? Solomon, he he was the richest man in the world at this time. He does not, in in no way does he exalt poverty as if it's something to be, be preferred to over wealth. I would say that most poor people would love the chance to be wealthy. I would say that and not not be off base. But from the beginning of time, there has always been more poor people than wealthy people. It's not as if the world's resources are evenly distributed despite what politicians would like you to think. It's not. So, This is less a statement about the way things are. No doubt this is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 26, 11, he said, the poor you will always have with you. And if those words, and you look at those words, and they may seem kind of callous to you, but they have to be interpreted in light of the proverb that we're looking at today. Jesus explains himself in the last part of that verse when he says, but you will not always have me. And I know I didn't put that in your notes or anything, but he says, you will not always have me. So if Jesus is among you, spend time with him while you can. Spend time with him while you can. Then go and feed the poor. Feed your spirit and then feed the hungry. If Jesus is among you, spend time with him while you can. The words of Solomon remind us that wealth, though, is no solution, correct? Wealth is no solution. But did you know that there's a verse in the Bible that says that money is the answer for everything? Look at Ecclesiastes, and I didn't put this in your notes, you can write it down. Ecclesiastes 10, 19. It says, bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life and money answers everything. Bet you never heard that verse. It's better to have some money than none at all. Yeah, I mean, the wealthy, they have big homes, they have nice cars, they have everything that, they, that you could possibly want in life. But listen to this. Death comes to the rich just as it comes to the poor. The rich get cancer and die. The rich divorce. The rich have problems with their children. Wealth 
provides only limited protection in this world, folks. Wealth provides only limited protection in this world. Wealth cannot compensate for the breakup of a marriage, for children in jail, for sudden death. I read about a wealthy man whose son died in a plane crash. Speaking of it later, he said, once you lose your son, you find out that there is no such thing as serious money. Life and death are serious. Money is not. So if you had to choose between wealth and the fear of God, I hope you would choose the fear of God. But here's the problem. Most of us don't get that choice, do we? We don't get that choice. My fear is that if we were given that choice, we would choose wealth. Because that's what the world places in front of us. My fear is that we would choose wealth. But most of us, we don't get that choice. The vast majority of the world will never be wealthy. But listen, folks, we can all fear the Lord. But there's another way to look at wealth, isn't there? As I was writing this and finishing this up last night, I was sitting on my couch. I was watching... TV, sort of. I had in one hand my cup of Sumatra blend coffee. It was really good. I have parked outside in my driveway a van and a truck. By the world's standards, I'm wealthy. I live in a four bedroom house. Could be a five bedroom if that one room had a closet. She can't count on his bedroom if it doesn't have a closet. By the world's standards, I'm wealthy. I think about that, and I think about the places that I've been in this world. Even some right here in America. When I pastored in Arizona, there was this, there was this community that was kind of tucked way back, away from everybody. And it was a community that I, I just grew an absolute heart for these people. And I realized these people, nobody was going in there. In this little community, you probably could have started a church right in this little community, which was something that we had thought about doing. And I gained a heart for these people, and I went back there. And for some of these people, because they were not wealthy people, but very poor people, for some of them, their restroom was their front yard. And we think in America? Yeah, right here in America. They didn't have running water in their house. Why? Because they couldn't afford a new well. Because in Arizona, your well has to be over 300 feet deep. Do you know how much that costs to drill? So if your well dries up, sorry, which is a very common thing in Arizona. But then I thought about Guyana. You know I have a heart for that country. I remember back in the day when we would go to Guyana, and I remember when I was 13, one of the first things I ever saw when we were driving, uh, well, when it wasn't night, because I've told you the story when we first got there. And after we crossed the stone, one of the first things I saw, and I was like, what? Was a guy out in his front yard with a hose over his head, or a bucket actually, uh, taking a shower, just out in the open in front of everybody with no clothes on. I thought, you can do that here? So the next day I woke up, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But but I thought to myself, wow. And even still today, many of the people of Guyana do not have running water inside their homes. They still have outhouses that they have to go to to use the restroom. And at night they, they, they board their homes up and they don't go outside at night so they use a bucket inside their home if they have to go in the night. They don't have running water. For some of them, it's a treat if they even have toilet paper. We think that's a basic necessity of life, right? That's why in Guyana, it's very rude to shake with your left hand. Because that's your wiping hand. And we think about that, and we think, that's crazy. But folks, this is the world. This is the world around us. We have so much in this country... And yet I look at the people of Guyana and I see these people and they have so much joy 
And they have so much thankfulness in their lives for the things that they do have. And I come home and I get angry if my TV cuts out for five minutes. Compared to the people of Guyana, I am the wealthy man of verse 16. I am the wealthy man. It is better to live with a roof over your head and with money in the bank and with food on the table, but it is better yet to live with the fear of the Lord in your heart. Folks, listen, we should not feel bad or sorry for having more than someone else. But what a fool I am if I think that somehow I deserve what I have or that I somehow am better than someone else who has less than I do. You see, folks, once again, I am the wealthy man of verse 16. You see, what do I have in life? What do I have in life that didn't come from God? You see, everything I have in life, everything I have in life is a gift from God. Every meal I have, every drink of clean water, every bit of electricity I have to power my computer so I can sit down and and type out a sermon, every book I read, every shirt I wear, every cup of soup or bowl of soup that's placed in front of me, it all comes from God. And Solomon does not put down those who have more. There will always be those who have more. If you go to Guyana, you you will see this beautiful mansion. And there are those in Guyana now. And right next door, you'll see a house that's no bigger than this stage that has six people sleeping in it. Someone will always be ahead of you in this world. And someone will always be behind you. And some will be right where you are. But not everything is equal. Better to live in poverty and know the Lord than to be the richest man in the world and think that you did it yourself. You never know when your riches will be taken away from you, will fly away from you someday. Even if if the rich man dies with all of his wealth, he'll lose it. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Whatever we make in this world, we will leave behind. And in that respect, we all come in and we go out the same way. You see, folks, the lesson is clear, isn't it? The lesson is clear. Most of us will never be truly rich in the world's goods. But we can all be rich in faith and love and rich in the knowledge of our God. J.I. Packer tells an acquaintance, whose career derailed because of his evangelical convictions. When asked if he harbored any ill feelings, he replied, quite simply, I've known God and they haven't. Packer goes on to note that most of us would not feel comfortable speaking in such straightforward terms. But the terms are entirely biblical, aren't they? Those terms are entirely biblical. Knowing God does make a difference. And in the defining characteristics of those who follow Jesus, to know God deeply and intimately more than makes up for the things that we lose because of our faith, right? To know God deeply more than makes up for everything else. Writing 250 years ago, English pastor John Gill summarizes the blessings of a man who fears the Lord. Here's what he writes. For such a man, though he has but little, which is the common portion of good men, yet he does not lack. He has enough and is content. What he has, he has with a blessing, and he enjoys it, and God in it, and has communion with him. And has also other bread to eat. The world knows nothing of, and particularly having the fear of the Lord. The eye of God is upon him with pleasure. His heart is toward him and sympathizes with him in all his troubles. His hand communicates unto him both temporal and spiritual meat, which is given to them that fear the Lord. His angels encamp about him. His power protects him. His secrets are with him. And inconceivable and inexpressible inexpressible goodness is laid up for him. Now I want you to let one sentence really sink in on you right now. What he has, he has with a blessing. And he enjoys it. And God in it. And has communion with him. Let me ask you a question. Can the world offer anything better than that? 
Can the world offer anything better than that? Look at number two. Fill your heart with love. Fill your heart with love. Write it down because we're going to jump right into verse 17. Fill your heart with love. Look at verse 17. It says, Better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. Now, I want you to hear this out of a few different translations, okay? And I didn't put these in your notes or anything like that. Just listen up. It says, Better a meal of greens with love than a plump calf with hate. Here it is out of another translation. A simple meal with love is better than a feast where there is hatred. Listen to this one. It is better to eat a little where there is love than to eat a lot where there is hate. And then this one taken out of the message paraphrase. It says, better a bread crust shared in love than a slab of prime rib served in hate. All of those versions come to the exact same place, don't they? They come to the exact same place. The most bountiful feast in the world may be ruined if the people at the table hate each other, right? Right? Discord at the dinner table, it destroys a good meal, no matter how sumptuous the fare. Whether it be prime rib or T-bone steaks or turkey and dressing and all the trimmings, your food may be as good as the food channel. It may even look that good, but if your love, if your, if your loved ones do not really love each other, what good is all that effort? What good is it? What good is all that effort and time that you spent in making that? You might as well skip the meal altogether. Now, look at this. The word vegetables there in that passage, it refers to the simple fare that a poor family might share. It might be spinach or collard greens or cabbage, whatever. This family is so poor that they are vegetarian by necessity, not by choice. Whether they come together, they share nothing but a handful of stewed greens. It's not extravagant. But it tastes good because, why? It's served with love. Solomon doesn't mean to elevate poverty above wealth. He merely reminds us that money doesn't necessarily bring happiness. Certainly doesn't guarantee a happy family or a harmonious Thanksgiving dinner. The point is, we know these things, don't we? Have you ever been, let me just ask you this, have you ever been to a meal, maybe it's Thanksgiving or whatever. Have you ever been to a meal where you just can feel the tension at the table? It's no fun, is it? I, I've been to a meal like that. It happened to be Thanksgiving one year. And we went and we sat at the table and it wasn't enjoyable. The food wasn't enjoyable at all. The meal wasn't enjoyable at all. You ever been there? The point is, we know these things, don't we? We know these things. We don't need Solomon to tell us because deep down we know that faith and love matter far more than money and fame. And that's one reason why we all, for a lot of us, we love this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, don't we? That's why it's still one of the most celebrated movies around Christmas time. When George Bailey is played by Jimmy Stewart, he contemplates suicide on Christmas Eve. And it takes the help of an angel named Clarence to help him see the difference his life has made. And as it happens, there's, there's really three great lines in this movie that are all done by the angel. Here they are. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? How about this one? You see, George, you've really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be just to throw it all away? And the third one isn't really a spoken line. It's the inscription in a book left for George by the angel as the movie comes to this climax. And here's what it says. Remember, George, no man is a failure who has friends. So if we know these things, why does Solomon have to remind us? Because we need reminding, that's why. We need reminding because we all live under the spell of this big world with its flashy lights and its alluring games and its beautiful people and the promises of the good life on the other side of the street. But yet powerful men throw it away all the time, don't they? 
I mean, just, just watch the news lately. These powerful men who are throwing their lives away. Why? Why? There was a man in the Bible who began to throw his, throw his life away by the name of King David. Do you remember that? King David, one day, he was out walking on the top of his palace and he looks over and he sees this beautiful woman, Bathsheba. Now, David should have never been there. David should have been out fighting with his army. That's where David was supposed to be. He was supposed to be with his men. But David wasn't. And he sees this beautiful woman, Bathsheba, and he makes a choice, doesn't he? And David begins to throw his life away. It's not until Nathan comes to to David does David kind of get his life finally back on track. Now, this may seem like I've kind of changed the subject, but I didn't. This is really all of Solomon's subject here. You have to remember the operative word in this whole talk today is the word better. It's better to enjoy a simple meal where love abounds than to feast at the finest restaurant. But here's what's so amazing. We read and hear the words of Solomon and we nod in agreement. Yeah, it's better not to have that. You know what? I shouldn't be like King David in that area. It's better not to have that. We nod in agreement. We nod in agreement. And we hear these words today. We read these words today. And then for many of us, we're going to leave here after we just nodded in agreement and we're going to make poor choices. And we're going to make bad choices. Wow. Don't make bad choices, otherwise that'll happen to you. We make foolish choices. But listen, folks, you don't have to live that way. Choose today who you will serve, the Bible says. See, I have set before you today life and death. Choose life that you may live. And that's wonderful advice given by Moses to the children of Israel. But even after all that wandering in the desert and after a whole generation died, they still made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. Last year, I I, I read the Bible in its entirety, and I try to do that every single year. Last year, the way I did it was, I read the Bible, but I read, I ended every day with a psalm. So I read through the book of Psalms like two and a half times or something like that. Three and a half times, I don't remember. There's like 150 chapters. You figured it out, I'm not even going to try. It would be two and a half times. I just figured it out. (laughs) And it ended every day with Psalms. And I was reminded last night of Psalm 78. I put it in your notes. I went back and I read it and I'm struck by the fact that Israel kept sinning and God would judge them and then he would forgive them and then they would just do it all over again. Look at it there in your notes, verses 40 to 41. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. How many of you have seen the post on Facebook that shows how long it should have actually taken them to walk? to uh, Israel. Some of you have seen that one. It's like six days, right? Do you remember how long it took them? (laughs) Forty years. Why? God had to judge them. And even after all of that, they still did dumb, foolish things. The people who knew what God had said earlier. They either forgot it or they didn't care or they thought they had a better idea or they just decided to go their own way. And these are the same choices we make today, isn't it? The same choices. It never worked out. But then you have this wonderful verse in verse 52. It says, But he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the wilderness. And that's us, folks. We're God's sheep. Every time you turn around, every time we turn around just like sheep, we're going our own way, aren't we? Every time we turn around, we just end up going our own way. Left to ourselves, folks, we'll get lost. Or we'll wander back to Egypt. 
or we'll start fighting each other, or we'll end up as as supper for the wolves. We're unruly, and we don't like to be led. And sometimes, folks, listen, we're just plain dumb. We are. But God leads his sheep all the way through the wilderness. And by his grace, eventually, we make it to safety and rest, and we make it to shelter. There is a better way to live. But it depends on us believing that our shepherd knows what he is doing, even when we think we have a better idea. If we have faith and if we have love, then we have what we need at this very moment. If we have faith and we have love, then we have what we need at this very moment moment. I want to close with the words from really one of our most beloved hymns. You'll find this in your hymnal. Here are the words. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his and have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you. And Father, as we think about thankfulness in this holiday, this season of thanksgiving, God, I just pray that it's not just now. That, Father, our thanksgiving is 365 days a year. That we are thanking you and praising you every day. Every day, Father. For the way you bless us. For the way you guide us. For the way that you lead us, Father. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never come into this relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe God is knocking on your heart right now and he's saying hey listen you want to have thankfulness in your life true thankfulness you want to have true blessing in your life well you got to have me and if that's you I just want you to pray just quietly right where you're sitting just you and God just say Father I need your son Jesus and right now I'm asking him to come into my life to save me from all of my sins. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth, died on the cross, rose again, so that I could have eternal life. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just take that little tear off? Would you mark that box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ? We're so excited for you. We want to help you on this journey of knowing and understanding what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you for all that you do for us, Father. You do so much, and yet we fail to see it, God. We fail to see your blessings so often. And Father, I just pray that we don't miss the blessings that you have for us, God. We will recognize those. So, Father...